So good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us again on our Monty Hardcat conference. And it's a real pressure, pleasure to have uh, Dr. Nives Gonzalo from San Carlos Clinic in Madrid to join us. I've been following and watching Nives for a long time and watched how she's come from a fellow to now, I think, an expert in intervention. And she's a truly a rising star. And I'm so delighted that you're going to share with us your experience in imaging and, and more, I'm sure. I let you know that, you know, um, Nevis, at yet at um, Monty, we do intracoronary imaging in 80% of our cases. So our faculty and our fellows, we expect them to learn, a, you know, to know it very well. But we also have a lot of faculty and people who join from around the world. So, you know, this is set up for fellows. So please think of it as, you know, as a talk for fellows. And we'll have the fellows join at the end for questions and answers. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Well, excellent percentage of intracoronary imaging. <laughs> Great. Um, so the presentation today is going to be uh, about the use of uh, intracoronary imaging in acute coronary syndrome. So first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's uh, my pleasure really to join uh, for this series um, of presentations. I, uh, I saw the list and uh, I mean, I'm really honored to be among uh, <laughs> the people invited for, this, uh, for these talks. So um, um, I thought this was an interesting topic because um, I mean, there's a lot of uh, information, of course, about the use of imaging to optimize PCI, but I think the use in, in, in acute coronary syndromes is the other uh, topic where imaging can be really helpful. And I'm going to, I'm going to try to present you uh, a series of uh, cases where really uh, the use of imaging changed um, what we did in the lab and uh, to try to show you the value of uh, these techniques in, in this context. So um, how can we use imaging uh, in ACS? First of all, uh, for corporate lesion assessment. And there are two aspects here. First of all, to identify the corporate lesion that sometimes is not easy. Sometimes uh, by angiography, it's difficult to know um, where is the corporate lesion. And second of all, um, to understand the physiopathology of the corporate lesion. And we know that there are some um, ACS that are of atherosclerotic cause, but there are also uh, cases of ACS that are uh, non-atherosclerotic and probably those are the most uh, interesting uh, specifically for imaging. So regarding atherosclerotic causes, of course, you all know that plaque rupture is the uh, most frequent cause of uh, ACS. And in this regard, OCT is uh, unique because uh, it can uh, identify the plaque ruptures with high accuracy. Of course, if you compare uh, IVUS and OCT, OCT uh, clearly wins in this regard, given the resolution to identify plaque rupture. But of course, what is interesting is that um, it's not only that you can see a plaque rupture, it can also give you information about the distribution. This is an example of a patient that came to the hospital with a cardiac arrest an anterior STEMI, as you can see, the LED was occluded, but it was also interesting to, uh, to see that he had other lesions in other vessels. You can see that he also has an irregular lesion in the cirque that was really a plaque rupture with thrombus overlying, and also another plaque rupture with thrombus in the RCA. And this is quite common, as you know, in patients with ACS, that they can have different plaque ruptures uh, along the coronary tree. And also another uh, interesting aspect of uh, plaque rupture detection is the chronology. And I think we all have had this situation where you um, uh, engage the coronaries, you do uh, a first angiogram and then you find this image in the left main, this ulceration. And of course, um, it's a situation where you don't know if you just created this, if it was there before. Well, in this um, context, uh, imaging can be quite useful, OCT especially, because well, when you see this image in OCT, you understand that this is uh, an old plaque rupture. You can see the cavity. You can see that is, uh, there are no rest of thrombus and release. This is an old plaque rupture that was there and uh, was not uh, really created uh, in this moment. It's nothing acute. So um, this about plaque rupture. But of course, the most interesting part, as I said, is that there are many uh, ACS that are not simply uh, plaque ruptures. And this is an example of uh, a young woman, which is probably um, the group uh, of population where we have more frequently this kind of other causes of ACS. This is a 40-year-old female 
that comes with an anterior uh, MI. And you can see in the angiogram, this is a still image, but I think you can appreciate that she has thrombus in the LAD. The flow in the LED at this moment was compromised. And uh, well, you can see that after opening the vessel, we performed OCT and you can immediately see in these cross sections that the vessel is full of thrombus. Um, in this uh, situation, we decided to aspirate the thrombus because it looked like there was quite some thrombotic burden at, the le at this level. And after thrombus aspiration, you can see that the vessel looks pretty normal in, uh, the, uh, in the angiogram and the flow was uh, fully recovered. So we did OCD again, and uh, you can see actually that uh, the vessel looks now um, cleaner. Uh, there's just a small amount of thrombus um, in uh, this area that you can see there, indicative with the asterisk. And it's also interesting to see, it doesn't look like there is much uh, plaque at this level. Um, it's difficult to know if there is a plaque rupture because uh, the thrombus is hiding a little bit what is behind, even when it is uh, a white thrombus, so not, not so much shadow, but it's not clear. So in this case, we decided really to uh, not stent uh, the patient because actually at this point there was no stenosis and wait a little bit more. And this is the um, angiogram one week later. And you can clearly see that uh, the angiogram uh, looks normal. There are no significant stenosis at this level. And if you look at this cross section there where the, there was still a little bit of thrombus uh, in the post uh, aspiration, you can see that now it's completely clean. And actually there is, um, there is a plaque there, but it looks more like a fibrous plaque at least a very thick fibrous uh, cup. It's not uh, a thick fi, it's not a lipidic high-risk plaque. And this is actually the type of plaques that you often see when the cause is an erosion. Um, and I always like to show this case because it's like, uh, I think with this, uh, you can really believe that this was an erosion. There is no plaque rupture here. Sometimes the diagnosis of erosion is made when there's still a lot, of, a lot of thrombus. And in these situations, of course, it's more uncertain because the thrombus can hide a black rupture that can, that can be behind. But of course, it's a situation where really uh, the diagnosis change because it's a case that you can clearly treat, treat without a stent implantation. Um, very few words about erosion. Uh, you know, is the most frequent lesion in uh, young women between uh, uh, below 50 years old um, uh, who died of myocardial infarction. Generally, you have more white thrombus. Um, and the important thing uh, from the clinical point of view is that it looks like it has better prognosis than black rupture in some studies uh, that have been uh, published. And this may be related with uh, the fact that these patients have less vulnerability, let's say in the uh, coronary tree. This is, uh, this has been published very recently uh, comparing patients with black rupture or plaque erosion and patients with black erosion have less high risk plaques in the coronary tree. So this uh, can be one of the causes of this uh, lower risk uh, of events that follow up. And the other important aspect is treatment. Uh, you can see that we treated these patients without stenting. There are several series reporting that this strategy can be safe. And there is a, a study, the erosion study that has uh, already a long-term follow-up uh, where patients were treated uh, with thrombus aspiration and uh, the APT without uh, stenting. And at four year follow-up, you can see um, that um, the results were not bad. It's a small study, only uh, 53 patients. Uh, however, at four, at four year follow-up, uh, there's a substantial uh, amount of patients uh, that underwent revascularizations, but more for progression than uh, for new um, uh, acute events at this level. So of course it could be, um, a safe strategy for a very selected group uh, of patients, treating these patients without uh, stenting. The other atherosclerotic cause, the third, so we have the plaque rupture, the erosion, and the third atherosclerotic cause of uh, ACS is the calcified nodule. And uh, this, is, um, uh, this is a patient we had in the lab. You can see that he had this filling defect in the osteal cirque. And these are corresponding images uh, on OCT and IBUS. And actually it's a patient um, that we did both techniques because uh, the calcified nodule in uh, OCT for some time, uh, it was uh, confused very often with red thrombus because um, it induces shadow 
as compared with normal calcium. Now, nodular calcium does not insute, uh, induce a shadow, but a nodular calcium does. And um, in this case, you can see clearly in IBUS that this uh, is not thrombus, this is uh, calcium. Um, you all know that this is more frequent in old people and especially in uh, patients with uh, renal disease, uh, patients that we see more and more, I think, and probably uh, same for you. Um, it's also, it has also been associated with um, regions with hinge movement, for example, the mid RCA and the osteal RCA. And I, I, I think you all have um, uh, realized that these lesions are very often in these locations. So what is important about the calcified nodule is that it's not always uh, associated with thrombus in the surface. And as I mentioned, the def differential diagnosis with red thrombus can be challenging. Um, and I always say when you're interpreting images uh, uh, for any technique, uh, the most important part is the clinical presentation, uh, the clinical context. And also, of course, you cannot look at just one frame. You need to look at all the, uh, the pullback. And I'm going to show you an example of how uh, a lesion can be misinterpreted and what can be the consequences. This is, uh, uh, again, a 50-year-old uh, patient. He had previous stents implanted in the RCA. And he comes to the hospital, he's admitted, he's admitted with progressive angina and a clinically positive exercise test. Um, you can see there the right coronary artery with the previous stands, and you can see this filling defect uh, uh, here in the amplified image on the right. So this is the OCT. I'm going to show you uh, the OCT that uh, the operator performed in this moment. There is the image of interest. You can see part of the stand, and I'm going to repeat it again. Here comes this. Uh, this is the area of interest. Well, um, at this time, this was uh, misinterpreted uh, as a red thrombus, and um, the operator decided to implant um, uh, directly in a stand. And of course, you can imagine what happened. Um, the result was not very good. He had to post a lid in a compliant balloon. And this is the final result that does not look very bad by angiography, but look at the uh, image in OCT. You can see that this is clearly a calcified nodule is protruding um, in, the, in the lumen. And uh, this is uh, the result after the optimization. Uh, fortunately, the lumen area is not too bad, but you can clearly see that this uh, is a calcified nodule and you can see it in the baseline images. But as, as I said, um, distinguishing calcified nodule from red thrombus sometimes can be difficult. Please always take into account the clinical presentation and the rest of the vessel. You could see in the pullback that it was full of calcium. So, so clearly this, this was a calcified nodule. Um, so this about um, the atherosclerotic causes. Let's move now to the second part, which is the non-atherosclerotic causes, which is probably the most interesting part. And again, here you have an example of a patient uh, that comes to the hospital with an acute coronary syndrome. He um, had very recently been diagnosed of atrial fibrillation, actually like two days before this event. He was not anticoagulated. You can see that he had this um, branch of uh, an obtuse marginal uh, occluded. And this is a result after a thromboaspiration. You can see again a situation where you have a completely normal vessel. Um, and this is the OCT uh, that we perform in this vessel. You can see that is uh, a vessel that is pretty normal. There is some intimal thickening. Um, you can see there the bifurcation with the other branch. But there are no signs of plaque rupture, no signs of thrombus. And this is an example of um, embolization. Uh, as a cause of acute coronary syndrome. And again, in this situation, I don't think any of you would implant an stent. So of course, this changes the treatment uh, of the patient. Um, the other very uh, important non atherosclerotic cause is the uh, spontaneous coronary artery dissection. The, uh, this is an example of quite some years ago of a patient that comes uh, with um, an uh, ACS. You can see the angiographic image where he has this long lesion, the, um, this very um, uh, long area where the vessel uh, lose uh, caliber and then it recovers distally. 
and you can see in the OCT cross sections, the um, area in A and B, you can see that there are actually two lumens in this part. More distantly in C and D, you can see some areas of hematoma. Uh, so this is um, an example of a spontaneous coronary artery dissection. It's an example of some years ago. And um, I think intracoronary imaging, but especially OCT, really have uh, ha has helped a lot of uh, to increase the recognition of this pathology that really clearly was uh, uh, underdiagnosed in the past. Uh, when we started doing imaging in lesions uh, like the one I showed, we started realizing that these were uh, dissections. I think it, is, it looks very clear now to everyone, but it was not like that before. These lesions uh, were not properly diagnosed. Um, I think um, that now we all have in mind these uh, images and is um, the recognition of this disease has increased a lot, but it still can be difficult sometimes, uh, especially in type two uh, and type three, uh, the uh, type of scat where you mainly have uh, intramural hematoma. Um, in these situations, sometimes angiography can uh, be difficult to uh, identify. And in this situation, sometimes uh, imaging could be useful. But of course, uh, we always need to understand that dissected vessels are very fragile and we uh, really need to think a lot before uh, we do any instrumentation on these vessels. And we really need to think whether it is absolutely necessary. We actually analyze uh, a series of patients uh, with uh, SCAT and imaging. And we saw that really uh, most of the complications um, were related with uh, imaging type one dissections, and especially when the imaging was done very acute in the face, uh, very acutely in the, in the process of uh, SCAT. So really um, these were the situations where more frequently you could have uh, an extension of the dissection. I think the typical situation is that you fenestrate the uh, the hematoma and you transform it into a type one uh, with a wire, for example, trying to wire. Um, and this was uh, most common when it's done very acutely in the uh, beginning of the symptoms of the patient. So my, um, what we do now is really, uh, we try not to do intracoronary imaging in SCAD unless it's really necessary for the diagnosis. Um, and uh, especially type two or uh, type two and type three. I think type two probably we don't uh, image most of them, only uh, some really some cases where it is really ambiguous. Um, in type three, it can be maybe more frequent because it mimics um, atherosclerosis more frequently. It always has to be done in segments that are amenable for imaging. So avoid, of course, always imaging if you have uh, a lot of tortuosity. And also imaging uh, is uh, very important, of course, if you are obliged to do PCI in these patients, that is something that always we try to avoid. But in the situation where you really need to intervene, uh, imaging can be very, very helpful. So um, this is the table from this uh, paper that I just mentioned, where we've reviewed our series. And if you're interested, you can go uh, back and review if you need to do uh, imaging, what are the recommendations to try uh, to avoid complications and what would be the, the indications. Um, but I'm going to show you a series of cases where you can see that sometimes uh, you really need to do it. This is uh, an example of, uh, again, young, young female, 50, 58 year old. She comes with chest pain uh, that starts a few hours after uh, an emotional distress, in this case, the death of a relative. Uh, she had ECG changes that you can see there and troponin elevation. And uh, an echo is performed that you can see there with um, apical dyskinesia suggesting that it could be a Takotsubo, so in this context of uh, emotional distress. And you can see here the angiogram, the right coronary artery was completely normal, as you can uh, observe. And in the LED, I'm gonna go back again so you can see, you can see the LED again. Well, you can see that there is some, this lesion there in the area of the septum looks like a moderate lesion. Um, there are also some images of kind of an ectastic area distally in the, in the distal LED. Um, this is the, the ventricle that actually could be compatible with uh, Takotsubo. 
Um, and this is uh, again in some steel images, the lesion in the mid LAD. So this is again uh, a case where you can have doubts about what is the um, substrate of this lesion. Is this really a Takotsubo or is there something else there? Well, this is the, um, the OCT that was performed in this case. I'm gonna let the pullback run for you. You can see quite normal vessel distally. And immediately here, you can see what is creating this stenosis in the uh, proximal LED in the area of the septum that you just uh, saw. It's an intramural hematoma. So it's an example uh, of uh, SCAT. Uh, SCAT, in this case, type three, because it was mimicking more um, atherosclerosis. Uh, it was mimicking a uh, stenosis caused by plaque. And you can see um, clearly this hematoma that was treated conservatively. Uh, and you can see the echo uh, one month later that uh, looks much better. So uh, the motion of normalities uh, have almost uh, resolved. And you can see this is the angiogram that was performed also one month later, where you can see that this um, stenosis is, uh, looks better. So the hematoma is probably in, in resorption at this moment. But you can see that this area distally, this area that look at TASIC for sure is another region where the vessel is dissected. And uh, it's, still, um, it's still there. So uh, this is a, uh, a case I think where imaging was very relevant because otherwise probably the diagnosis could have not been correct. The patient could have been diagnosed of a Takotsubo, but really it was not. Um, I'm going to show you another couple of uh, examples where we um, thought that the imaging was really necessary. This is um, a 62-year-old female again, a young woman. You can see the right is normal. She comes with an anterior STEMI. And I'm going to show you uh, some more images of the LED. <coughs> Excuse me. Here, um, you can see that the LED is uh, actually occluded in the mid distal segment. There's some filling uh, there of the distal LED that looks very thin, um, but this uh, the vessel is uh, occluded. <clears throat> I'm gonna show you um, the ibos we had after wiring this vessel because um, we had the suspicion that this was not a normal uh, STEMI. And well, you are already seeing um, what happened here and what is the cause of this uh, occlusion. You can, you can see again that this is um, a hematoma. You can see very clearly how the EL, this black line is inside. So you can see the intimal media is uh, separated from the appendicia. And what is interesting, it is, is um, something that we all also see very commonly in uh, SCAD is that it extends yeah, much more than it would look by angiography. You can see that it extends actually almost to the um, to the osteal uh, LED. So really, uh, even when in angio, it does not look so extensive. Um, the hematoma is extending almost to the osteal LED. In this case, um, well, the vessel, the distal vessel was very thin and it was occluded. So we decided to fenestrate it to try to uh, recover a little bit of flow distally. Uh, you can see a small balloon there to try to fenestrate it. And with this, we recovered some flow. But of course, you can see that all the vessel is uh, dissected. I mean, it's all hematoma from uh, the very distal part to the to the ostium. In this area that looks a bit more normal in, angi in the angiogram, <clears throat> you could see that there was uh, <clears throat> there was some hematoma there also. <coughs> and this is the final uh, result in this case after fenestrating um, this uh, this area. So um, this was an example of a SCAT, but look at this. I mean, it, and it happened actually very, these patients came very, <laughs> very, um, like two days in between this, these two cases. And this was uh, actually in the middle of Christmas. This is in the middle of the night, 32 year, 32 year old, uh, she's pregnant. Uh, and she comes to the hospital after a very prolonged chest pain, more than 12 hours. And they uh, see in the in the in the ECG that she has an anterior STEMI, and of course immediately you're thinking that this is for sure going to be 
another dissection. So I was thinking again, oh dear, no, another another scat, which is for me the most horrible thing you can <laughs> you can encounter in the lab, the most difficult cases. Um, is you can see that is the osteal LED occluded, um, and um, this is the imaging we did in this uh, in this case because of course it's a situation where you really need to intervene. You need to open the vessel. And in these cases, uh, imaging is very important, for example, to understand that if you are or not in the true lumen, uh, like we saw in the, in the case before. Well, this is uh, the ABUS in this case. I'm going to forward it a little bit for you so you can see the area of interest, which is the proximal LED. And you can see that there is actually something uh, there that looks more like a plaque or a thrombus. You can see that the, the media is outside, so it's really not a hematoma is really not a dissection, but is uh, it looks like a huge uh, thrombus or plaque in the osteal LED. So uh, in this case, the clinical presentation um, was quite misleading because it's a, it's a pregnant woman, so you would expect a dissection, but it is not. And actually, it's a case that was quite um, quite difficult to manage. Um, this is after dilating the proximal LED with balloon. And I think it looks more clear now that she has a big thrombus in the proximal LED, but actually we were not able to obtain a very good flow uh, in the LED and the diagonal, uh, even after stenting. As I, as I said, uh, she has been with chest pain for a very, very long time. And uh, the flow we were able to recover was not good. Probably there was a lot of uh, disease in the microcirculation, probably some embolization of the thrombus uh, also. So it's an unfortunate case, but clearly a case where you could expect a dissection and it is not. So um, as I said, in a scat in general, we try not to image, but there are some cases where we really need to, need to do it. This is just to show you the difference between the two cases. Uh, on the left, you can see this is the, the um, very young pregnant woman where you can see this black thrombus in the proximal LED. You can see the EEL indicated here in the blue line is outside in contrast with the other uh, lady where you can see that the, um, there is clearly a hematoma. You can see the intimo media, uh, the black line showing the, the media that is inside and separated from the adventition. So, um, I don't, I don't know, Asim, if there are any questions or which I should continue or if you, at least, I mean, if you want to interrupt me at any point or there are any questions uh, or should uh, I continue okay. or in the end, as you, as you prefer. Yeah, I think we'll do a lot most of the questions at the end, but there was a question here, yeah, maybe just because so, it's relevant to the case you showed. They said the patient with the, the female patient with the thrombus, did you consider thrombectomy before stenting? Well, I guess the one with no reflow. Hmm. Um, it could have been considered, but I think um, I really don't think the, um, the not flow in this case was caused by embolization, but it was caused more by, uh, you know, very prolonged uh, occlusion of the artery and a lot of um, damage on the microcirculation, more than embolization, you know, generated at the beginning. Because even when the thrombus was there, you can see, it, you could see that the, the flow distally was really, really bad and it yeah. didn't, you know. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so... Um, I'm gonna to move to uh, the next part, just um, just finishing. Just uh, as I said, sometimes uh, the problem is that you are not really. Uh, sometimes the problem is that you don't. It's not that you have a corporate lesion and you don't know what is there behind, but the problem is that you don't really understand which one is a corporate lesion. That happens quite often, I think, in the lab also. And uh, this is a, another example. Um, uh, again, it's a patient that comes with a non-STEMI. Um, he actually has uh, he actually had some ST elevation that was normal uh, normalized after uh, nitro. He had some uh, troponin rise, and then the next morning when he was actually going to the lab, he had a new episode of chest pain. And you can see this is the angiogram. Um, so of course the problem here is that he has. Uh, an occlusion of the LED, and no doubt this is the problem, uh, and this is what is creating um, the uh, the event. But you can see that he has this uh, lesion also in the proximal LED that looks like a plaque fracture. So of course the question here was: uh, Is this um, a distal embolization 
from this proximal plug rupture or is really a local problem in this distal lady that is um, generating the problem? Is this embolization or it's just a local problem of the, of the distal lady? Well, this is the, the OCT and I'm gonna advance it a little bit uh, just to focus on the area of interest that you will see now coming uh, in this uh, proximal lady. And there it is. So you can see that there is a plaque rupture, but it's very similar to the one I showed at the beginning in the left main. It looks like a very chronic uh, plaque rupture and there are no rest of thrombus there. So clearly this is not the corporate uh, that, uh, this is not recent plaque rupture with thrombus that has embolized. Um, the problem in this case was uh, clearly the distal lesion and it was a, a local thrombosis uh, in the distal, mid distal lady and not an embolization from this proximal plaque rupture. So clearly well, we treated the mid distal lady and this was the result. And we decided not to treat this proximal lesion because this was, as I mentioned, a very chronic um, plaque rupture. And I think you have all seen these lesions very often uh, or quite often. Many plaque ruptures, um, of course, heal. Actually, plaque rupture and healing is a way of uh, plaque growing, uh, plaque growth. Uh, but sometimes when the cavity is so big, uh, it really does not fill with uh, material. And sometimes you can have these chronic uh, ulcerations of the, these chronic plaque ruptures persisting uh, there and uh, giving these images that sometimes can be confusing, like in this, uh, in this case. So probably you are maybe familiar with this um, figure that comes from uh, the consensus document of uh, EAPCI on the use of imaging that was actually very focused on ACS. And uh, I recommend you um, this document because I think it's, um, it's quite interesting summarizing many of the things that we just, um, that we just saw. Um, this is an algorithm of how uh, how to manage patients with ACS, when are you going to perform imaging, um, in which cases it would be indicated, as I, as I said, basically cases where you have an ambiguous uh, and geography or cases sometimes where you don't have a clear culprit uh, lesion on uh, and geography. And finally, a few words about thrombus, which is uh, of course, um, <laughs> our worst enemy when we have uh, an ACS, especially when there is a lot of thrombus burden. Um, and in this, um, in this context, OCT is really very useful because it can give you a lot of information about the thrombus. We know that sometimes in angiography, the evaluation of the amount of thrombus and the distribution of thrombus is not, um, is not excellent. Uh, with uh, OCT, you can know uh, exactly which type of thrombus do you have, whether it's red thrombus, whether it's uh, white thrombus as in the middle image you can see there, or if you have a very organized thrombus, like in the image you can see on the uh, right uh, panel. Uh, also the distribution that can be relevant sometimes for treatment, as I'm gonna show you uh, in, a, in a minute, an example demonstrated that. The chronology, as I said, you can distinguish acute from organized thrombus and also the thrombus uh, burden. Just the final example I wanted to show you is a very uh, young uh, man that comes uh, again with a non-STEMI. Um, and I'm gonna show you here the angiogram of what he had in this, uh, um, in his uh, LAD, proximal LAD. You can see this filling defect in the, in the angiogram. You can also actually see something in the distal lady that could look like embolization. It was clear that he had thrombus um, there in the proximal LED. But of course, what is important uh, now for, um, for us is to understand um, uh, the distribution of this thrombus, no? because it's located in a very complex area. And you can see this is the OCT that we performed. You can see there the longitudinal uh, image in the upper part. And you can see that he had a lot of red thrombus uh, in the proximal LED. And you can see that it stands also to the uh, to the left main in the in the image we have on the on the right panel. So um, of course, it's a situation where you have uh, thrombus that is standing uh, to the left main. 
uh, another important aspect, uh, aspect is that the vessel is really huge, very big vessels. So uh, we decided to treat him um, conservatively with uh, medication. You can see there triple therapy uh, plus, um, in this case, Aptixima when it was still available. And uh, we waited. And I think in these situations, it's also important to wait uh, enough because sometimes uh, if you uh, repeat the angiogram in a couple of days, it still looks pretty much the same. But if you wait enough time, you will get uh, this kind of images. It looks pretty normal. In, by angiography. If you have a look at OCT, really there is some rest of thrombus only in the proximal LED, but the left main looks now clean of thrombus. Um, and in this case, we decided to discharge him with uh, anticoagulation. I think uh, probably also the clinicians were a bit concerned about the location of the thrombus in the OCL LED. So he was discharged with APT and anticoagulation, and the angiogram was repeated one month later. You can see that it's completely normal in the angiography and also in OCT. And what is interesting, he doesn't have a residual thrombus uh, left after one month, and it doesn't look like he has a lot of plaque also in the proximal AD. So again, it's probably an example of an uh, erosion. So um, I think just to summarize what, uh, what I said in the, in the presentation, I think imaging is very helpful in ACS for corporate lesion assessment to understand the physi physiopathology, also the thrombus burden, and whether we have a target for PCI. Um, regarding the interventional treatment, of course, if we understand uh, the physiopathology, we can uh, uh, answer this question is, do we need a stent or can we treat this lesion without stenting? Uh, also, if we have a lot of thrombus burden, is this the best time uh, for uh, implanting an stent, or do we really need to implant an stent in a situation? In the situation, patient just uh, I just presented, and of course, if you need to do uh, a PCI and implant an stent, you can take advantage of all the information you get from imaging regarding sizing and optimization. And finally, for thrombus, uh, as I said, imaging is very useful for quantification distribution and monitor the response if you decide, decide to manage it uh, medically. And that was all. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was excellent news. Um, thank you so much. It really shows, I think, how much we've progressed in kind of making our decisions in the cath lab, uh, especially in the most complex patients like ACS, where there's a wide differential diagnosis. And we're not just, you know, throwing stents at patients, but we really using the best knowledge we can to understand what's actually causing the patient's symptoms. And I think, you know, in, I mean, really the examples you show and the way you, the way to change how you manage your cases is really fantastic because it really highlights the importance of imaging. So I'm going to let the, I'm sure the fellows have a lot of questions. So I'm going to pass you on to our fellows. I hope you don't mind. Uh, Andrea, I see you there first. So maybe you can start. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. I was interested in the first part when you spoke about the erosion of plaque. I wanted to ask you, how do you select patients for not stenting? Because you say that it's available only for a selected patient. So, and which is your, your practice, the percentage of imaging in acute coronary syndrome? Um, so I think my, in my practice, the percentage of imaging in general is, should be around, yeah, as you said, 70 or something like this. I don't know specifically in ACS. The, in general, I, I use imaging in ACS when it is not a clear black rupture that you just have an stenosis and you're going to implant an stent, unless you want to, of course, use imaging to optimize. Um, about erosion, I mean, the diagnosis of erosion is not easy in the acute phase because you have a lot of thrombus and sometimes it's difficult to understand whether you have a plaque behind a plaque rupture behind or not. I think it depends very much on the result you have, especially if you if you do thromboaspiration, if you really uh, are able to properly aspire the thrombus and you you are able to see that there is not a tight stenosis and there is not a lot of uh, a residual thrombus burden. These are the situations where you can decide to wait and uh, decide whether this is a patient that can be managed conservatively. Um, in general, when you do this uh, thing, unless you 
unless you completely extract the thrombus and you don't see anything like in the embolization case I, I showed, in general, we tend to repeat the angiogram in some days to determine whether uh, you know, it, has, it is completely clean now and it's clear that it's a case that does not need a stenting. Because sometimes in the acute phase it can be difficult with the thrombus. In that case, you always repeat the angiography, even at one month, as, as you showed before. No, usually it's uh, less than one month. Um, usually, I mean, in a patient where, for example, you do thrombus aspiration uh, and the result is good, you have good flow, you don't have clear stenosis, but probably there is some residual thrombus. These are the cases that we repeat, for example, at one week uh, around this. Uh, generally, I, we tend to wait around one week to really uh, let the antithrombotic treatment uh, clear the thrombus properly. Thank you. Hmm. Thanks, Sandra. And if there are any other questions, please put them in the chat and we'll have them answered. Jesse? Uh, thank you, Dr. Gonzalez, for a wonderful talk. I really enjoyed the images and the, the pathology that you showed, really, really uh, great case samples. I noticed that some of the cases you, de you decided to use OCT, other cases you decided to use IVIS. I can think of a lot of benefits for IVIS, especially in the setting of ACS, when you're thinking about Timmy flow, use of contrast, um, and you're also able to get a lot of the big diagnoses such as thrombus and dissection and hematoma that you could catch with either imaging modality. What is a scenario in which you would have to use OCT? I can only think of benefits of IVIS. Hmm. Yeah, well, I think um, <laughs> um, I think um, of course OCT can give you um, a lot more detail on most of these aspects. For example, back rupture, thrombus. You can see it much clearly with uh, OCT. So if your objective is understanding the physiopathology, let's say OCT, I think has a lot of advantages because with IBUS, the resolution sometimes is not enough to understand whether there is um, a, a black rupture or sometimes even whether there is a thrombus or not. No? Sometimes in IBUS it's very difficult to see the thrombus or distinguish it from the plaque. Uh, so in these cases, I think um, OCT has advantages. As you mentioned, and I fully agree, performing OCT in the context of an acute case with thrombus that is interfering with images is uh, sometimes complex. Um, but I think if you want detail, probably OCT is gonna give you more detail. IVUS uh, has the advantage of, uh, of course, not using contrast. And for example, in the context of SCAT, it can, uh, it can have big advantages, especially in situations where you need to intervene to understand if you are in the true lumen or not, et cetera. So I think it depends on uh, what is your purpose. But if, if, you, uh, if you need detail, if you need resolution to understand what is behind, you, um, I think OCD has advantages. And then just to uh, follow up on that. So if you are using OCT and you're worried about flow distally or at the site of the lesion, what's your uh, procedure? Do you do thrombectomy? Do you dot her first? How do you make sure you'll get adequate image quality with OCT? No, of course, of course, the, the first thing is to recover flow in the, in the vessel before doing any imaging, both IVUS or, or OCT. So you can use uh, thrombectomy or you can use... Um, um, balloon angioplasty, would you uh, decide is best for the case if you think there's uh, a high thrombus burden and you can uh, extract it with thrombectomy, that's, um, that's probably the best because then you will, of course, reduce the thrombus burden and you will be, uh, you will be able to see better what is uh, there behind. Um, but of course, the first thing is uh, to recover flow in the vessel before doing any imaging, of course. So thank you so much. So Shaky, do you have any comments? I see you in the back there. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, so, so for calcified nodule tails case, I think uh, IBUS is better than OCT. Uh, Sorry, that, can, you, yeah. can you repeat the question? Uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, for calcified nodule diagnosis, uh, OCT is, uh, sorry, IBUS is better than OCT. So sometimes mm. we misdiagnose the uh, calcified nodule with only OCT. Well, I think now we are, I think now this does not happen so often. <laughs> I mean, I just showed you this extreme case. For, for some time, it was confusing. I, um, I, I agree. And uh, there were cases where we thought it was a thrombus. And then it, but I, I think in, in all these cases, my main message is interpret it in the context. I mean, um, uh, if you have a lot of calcium all around, 
and the presentation is not an acute coronary syndrome, is of course more probable that is a calcified nodule. But I think now we are recognizing quite good uh, calcified nodules in OCT in the past. I, I fully agree that sometimes it was confusing. Yeah, but a if there is a slumbus over calcified nodule, like uh, we, we cannot see like uh, behind the slumbus if it's OCT, right? So Yes. <clears throat> yeah, with the calcified nodule, you also have um, shadow. The thing with calcified nodules is that usually they are very limited to uh, a limited part of the vessel circumference. So in general, you will, if there is not much black around, you will be able to see the rest uh, of the vessel. But um, but clearly you have shadow behind, same as with thrombus. Yeah. Thank you. And one more question. So for Takotsugo like case, uh, you, you said like scat in mid LED, but uh, like uh, sometimes we see Takotsugo and the mid LED like a 50% stenosis. So do you think we need to do imaging more for that kind of case? And then, and also like uh, this LED, we have a, uh, you, you had a flaw at that time, but uh, like a kinesis of like a global LEA, which means mm. like uh, more stenosis, like uh, before you an before you, you did angiogram. What, what do you think about that? Mm. Yeah, so I think this is a problem when you um, when you ha have the diagnosis of Takotsubo, no? because it looks like it in the echo, et cetera, or in the, in the ventricle you do, but then you have some atherosclerosis. And of course, the, the situation is a bit more, um, no, it's a bit, the diagnosis is a bit more <laughs> conflicting. It's more challenging, case, absolutely. I think, yeah, I think in these cases, um, imaging can be, can be useful to understand whether you really, uh, have a plaque that is um, that is some sometimes it can be maybe a plaque rupture no that you have had an acute uh, rupture of a plaque that has embolized and then you have these um, apical um, uh, abnormalities because you have for example a thrombus that embolized I think it can give you information uh, diagnosing Takotsubo when you have uh, an stenosis I mean sometimes it's, uh, it's difficult I think you really need to uh, make sure that there is not uh, something underlying there. I think the number of times we've seen um, apical ballooning co and what we call takutsubo coexist with either a ruptured plaque or scad or uh, even multivessel disease. I mean, we kind of, you know, um, I think you're right. Uh, it's only when we started doing more imaging in these patients that we start understanding that maybe that 50% lesion was actually a scab, right? And it was an yeah. intraural hematoma that's probably getting spasm intermittently. <clears throat> and so the coronaries are not completely normal. So I think if you have any doubt, um, it's become such a low risk procedure to do imaging that, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, I agree. Samina? Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Gonzalo, for the great talk. I really enjoyed uh, the uh, images and cases that you shared with us. It was great. Um, my question is, uh, in the case of you know ACS, when sometimes we have these patients come with like really large, enormous, um, like big vessel diameter RCA. Um, when would you think about that? Probably OCT cannot opacify the whole vessel, and maybe we should go IBIS, like from the angiography. What hmm. size vessel? Um, like on the angiography would make you think that I should go with IVUS instead of, because I've had cases that we couldn't opacify the whole vessel well with the OCT. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, you're right. This can happen. I mean, if you have a very large vessel, this can be a limitation for OCT. It's true that you can, in general now uh, with OCT, you can see very big vessels, but it's true that, um, that obtaining a good clearance of uh, the blood in this uh, ectasic vessel, let's say, uh, is, is, is very difficult. So there are, this, uh, this is a good indication for IBUS. And IBUS is excellent for most of the indications I, I presented. Of course, uh, the resolution is lower, so there are some certain things that you won't be able uh, to see, but uh, for, the, for the main uh, indications, uh, it, it is uh, as useful as OCT. Right. And then the other question I had, again, is the, it goes back to my limited experience, um, that sometimes you see the guide is kind of like, um, is um, kind of dives in uh, frequently during the case. Would that make you concerned that going with the OCT in those kind of scenarios that you may kind of, um, you know, do a veg in injection and kind of um, have an issue with the OCT um, if the guide is not sitting right? 
Yeah, well, I mean, to do a proper OCT, you need to make sure that your getting catheter is well, well engaged, that you are able to uh, properly deliver the contrast in the, in the vessel, otherwise you won't get uh, good uh, blood clearance and you won't get good images. Um, and of course, this is uh, something that you always need to think when you are going to do an OCT, that you really need to um, yeah, do the contrast quiet. and both the vessel size and both being able to properly engage the catheter are both right. uh, two, two things you really need to think. Uh, mm -hmm. when deciding uh, if, you, if you're going to do OCT or IBUS. Mm. So any, any tips and tricks, though, to improve a pacification? I mean, do you ever, if it's like a massive left main and you're trying to see the LED, do you ever, for example, use a guide catheter extension to be slightly more selective in the LED? Have you mm. ever done that? I don't, I don't use it much. I, I've heard that people do it, but... Mm -hmm. To be honest, I'm a bit uh, worried about these injections on the guidance. So, I mean, for me, it's a bit um, doing these high pressure injections because here we have uh, injectors. So doing these mm -hmm. high pressure inject injections through the um, through the guide extension, um, I, I'm always a bit scared of uh, being able to create some dissections, etc. But I, I know that some people do it, and I think probably can be done without uh, without problems to be more selective in uh, in these areas. Yeah. And do you, I mean, depending, you know, I've heard some people say that they look at the diameter of the left main, okay, and they, they based on the diameter, they increase the flow rate when they give the injection with, uh, you know, with the automatic injectors, with the machine injectors. Do you do anything like that based on the size of the vessel? I, I try to adjust it to the to the size of the of the vessel and um, okay. also how it opacifies when you do an angiogram and if you see that it uh, in the angiograms you have done with for example this volume you had a good uh, clearance then probably you can use this but um, the main the main thing with this is probably is try to avoid failed pullbacks <laughs> that's the main thing so that's use the contrast that is needed i mean and do a good pullback instead of doing three very bad pullbacks where you in the end spend more okay. contrast see so don't see anything all right excellent sorry samina were there any other questions no thank you so much okay um bob i don't know if you had a question uh, and yeah. then we'll go on to the chat okay yes i did thank you again for the talk my dr nervous uh, you know so two brief questions. The first one is about scanning these patients. You know, I know sometimes we do the imaging, or most times you should do the imaging with the IVOS, make sure that you're in true lumen. You know, what are your thresholds after fenestration in some patients? You have some flu. They are usually very young patients. What are your thoughts about stenting in these patients, um, you know, to maintain that flu? Because there's a whole talk about healing and conservative management. And the second question as pertains, I think uh, you may have answered this already with Jesse, to piggyback on the OCT versus Ivotin and acute, you know, acute face coronary syndrome, uh, especially in patients with thrombus. Is there any concern with this high volume contrast injections in OCT, especially for a new operator? Do you think that that's safe and effective to do in an acute coronary STEMI situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, so. Starting with the second question, I think it's safe to uh, to do OCT in a in an STEMI. Um, I mean, it's uh, I don't have, I have never had an, an a problem of, for example, embolizing the thrombus, etc. As I mentioned, you need to do imaging. You need to decide the moment where you do imaging, and it's the moment when it's going to be efficient. It's the moment where you're going to be able to see something. So try to, you know, do your um, angioplasty, your thrombectomy. Try to prepare. The, um, the vessel and then you do imaging because it's when you're going to be able to, to see something, let's say. And I have never had situations of, you know, embolizing the thrombus with the OCT injection. I, I, I think it's pretty safe if you if you want to do it. About the, um, about the SCAT, I think um, it's very, uh, I mean, if you need to implant an stent in a patient uh, with the SCAT, I think we all have had this uh, experience. It's generally uh, very, very difficult. Generally, what you do is just extend the dissection at the edges of the of the stand and uh, make uh, your life uh, more and more difficult. Sometimes it's really needed because you have an occlusion and you're not able, for example, to open the vessel for a straightening, etc. But I think these new techniques of trying to just you know fenestrate the vessel, recover flow, let the vessel heal, because we know now uh, that the natural history 
of these vessels will be healing if they recover flow. I think this is the, the way to go because I, I've really had um, horrible experiences in patients with SCAT uh, where you really uh, needed to stand or we didn't have this idea of trying to fenestrate. I think uh, we are trying to get um, uh, to avoid standing always if we can in these patients because of course uh, you can lose branches because sometimes you are, you can be in the distal uh, part in the true lumen but in the middle you are in an area that you are not you're losing branches etc it's, it's a horrible situation so, I mean for me it's the worst scenario you know trying to intervene in a scat patient so I always uh, try to avoid standing if I can thank you right um there's maybe one of the last questions from the chat um, is a lot of people are, are looking for ways to, I mean, one of the limitations of OCT is, is the fact that you use contrast, right? Uh, so some people have used Dextran uh, to do OCT with, and there's also some work now on, on saline injections for, a, for OCT. Any thoughts on these? Are, are you doing any of these when you have paid? What's your preferred method when you have patients with chronic kidney disease? So, um, I think in general, the 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 most important part is um, do the pullbacks um, when they're efficient. So, do the pullbacks in the moment when you are gonna be able to see things. The other part is avoid angiograms. So, if you're gonna do OCT, don't do angiograms because uh, you know for the same price you get an angiogram and an OCT. And as I said before, it's better to use a little bit more contrast and obtain a good pullback. And with that, you have all the information. You don't need to do any more angiograms than doing a lot of, uh, you know, bad pullbacks and then three angiograms in the middle because I want to check this and that. I mean, I think there's a lot of contrast that you can save um, in, the, in the lab and okay. that can allow you to do an OCT. Um, the, I don't have experience with uh, using dextrain or saline. I think, uh, I mean, the advantage of the strain is not clear to me because uh, there are also you know, reports about the strain. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> uh, being bad for kidneys. About yeah. renal function with the strain, etc. Yeah. So Agreed. I don't see really the advantage of that. And with saline, probably with saline, you will never get uh, the, you know, crystalline images we get with contrast. But probably right. for clinical purposes, in many cases, is enough. So maybe it's in a scenario to, to explore. You will always get this kind of speckle because you will have always some blood, but probably for, uh, especially for, you know, optimizing PCI, sizing, et cetera, mm -hmm. for these uh, situations, probably it's enough. So I think uh, we're going to see more of this in the future, but I think you can save a lot of contrast. Um, and if it's a case where you really want to do OCT, you need to be thinking from the beginning, I'm not going to do any angiogram. So I'm going to do an angiogram that is my OCT. Mm -hmm. Really, you need to do more views, etc. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, this was a phenomenal morning class. We all learned so much. Great examples, great cases, very thoughtful of how you used imaging. And we really enjoyed le learning from you this morning. Thank you. It was my